Ruth. I'm a junior doctor. Um, I've been helping Lahira organize these free lectures through ABCs of Anesthesia. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming along tonight. Um, we've got Daniel tonight. He's a junior doctor from Western Health in Melbourne, um, just finishing up his intern year now, so has a breadth of experience and is going to be able to tell us all about the most important ward calls that you're bound to get as an intern. Um, so I'll hand it over to Dan. If you've got any questions at all, um, feel free to message in the chat or unmute yourself um, as well. And yeah, we'll go from there. All right, over to you, Dan. Thanks, Ruth. All right, thanks everyone for for joining in today. So yeah, so we'll be going through just some some of the kind of basic things in terms of ward calls and what to expect and how to approach them. I guess just a bit about myself. So yeah, I did um, medical school at ANU in Canberra, but I grew up in Melbourne, so got back for um, internship. I'm doing that at Western Health. It's been an excellent year. And I guess outside of medicine, I'm a dad at two, so it's another type of chaos, I guess, but it's um, a nice way to balance things out. So as you know, like ABCs of Anesthesia, we've got a whole plethora of resources. We've got the podcast, YouTube videos, the website. So always lots of you know good information, bits of bits of um things that we're always updating. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook pages, um, always updating with new information. So so join in on those. But I guess getting into the um, presentation. So ideally, it'd just be yeah, it'd be great to have everyone's cameras on just to help kind of facilitate discussion. Um, you know, you're all towards the you know, at the end of med school now, finish exams. Everyone's very capable intelligent so you know it'd be great to have everyone um, chime in give their ideas so we can all learn from each other and yeah so for the presentation I guess the objectives I find I think it's great to have a common framework to approaching anything in medicine and you know during I remember during simulation in med school it was always nice to have that a b c d e framework as a kind of fail safe you know there were situations when you get into that you know you're a bit, like you might be a bit confused, might not where to go to, so not might not know where to go towards. So it's nice to have a framework, and I think approaching ward calls should be um, of a similar vein. So we'll go through that general framework to um, approach any situation, and then we'll talk about some common ward calls, as well as assessing for certain red flag conditions within those ward calls, and then just briefly talk about appropriate escalation because. Junior doctors should always feel comfortable, you know, escalating to scenes and there should always be um, help available. You should never feel like you're on your own. And certainly my experience has been, there's always been excellent support around the hospital. So these are the common ward calls that we'll go through. I think for the first one, um, I can kind of just go through just the general framework for it. Um, there's some quite word heavy tables, but that's more so um, because because it will be recorded and uploaded to YouTube later, you'll have these slides as a reference, then you can make, you know, use that information to make your own cheat sheets, have them ready on your phone. So when you're on the wall, something you have a quick reference um, to go to. Um, so yeah, we'll be going through your hypertension, hypertension, and tachycardia, low oxygen sats, blood sugars, and low urine output. So going into the framework, I think this is a framework that I use and um, I find it quite useful just to be able to yeah, have that cognitive aid that I can always refer to. So I think, and it's kind of divided into two separate parts. The first part is um, really just trying to maximise your efficiency um, because you will have situations where you have lots of pages and you've got to, kind of got to sift through them all. So it's important to be efficient with your time. So what would generally happen is you'll get a page um, from the nursing staff you know, explaining some type of situation. And the first thing to do is... You know, give the nursing staff a call back. There's certain information I think is important to get over the phone and then you can use that time to also give some basic instructions just to get some management things or some investigation started. So by the time you get there, the ball is already um, rolling. Then from there, it's really just your normal patient assessment and management steps. So looking at through the medical record just to help set the scene and the context for the presentation, doing a targeted review, so your history exam, maybe some bedside investigations. Then in your mind, thinking about what differentials um, they, uh, could be occurring and really dividing into, you know, red flag things and then common things. And then starting a basic management plan and follow-up. And your management plan may involve other investigations that need to be ordered as well as some basic treatments and then having a good follow-up plan as a safety net. 
And yeah, I think, yeah, having this kind of framework and just doing it consistently each time helps minimize the chance of um, missing things and helps increase familiarity. So you'll be more and more comfortable the more times you do it. So going into hypotension. So over the phone, you know, the first thing you can ask, so you get, you get the page, the patient's blood pressures, you know, whatever the number is, you give the nursing staff a call back. First thing I would ask, you know, does a patient, is a patient well or unwell? And, uh, you know, nursing staff are quite good at assessing the patient from the end of the bed, and they'll be able to tell you that. And you should also ask, you know, what are the other observations? And is the patient symptomatic or asymptomatic? I think the, like, asymptomatic hypotensive patient is such a common page, particularly if you've got, you know, younger patients who are well, like, it's quite common to get that page. So it's an important question to ask. And then a simple thing that you can get organized by the time you get there is asked to organize a manual blood pressure and an ECG. And then I'd have a look on EMR, go through the medical record. So just to get some context, so, you know, the reason for admission, any recent ward round notes. You know, for example, you know, if the patient has just come in with an infection, um, and that helps set the context because the first thing you'd be thinking about, you know, is this patient septic? So that's just an example of, of, of the things to read through and the things to think about going through the past medical history, any current medications such as anti-hypertensive medications, and also just looking at the trend of the blood pressure and the heart rate, are they febrile? Because then this, again, helps you work out, you know, red flag diagnosis versus common things. After you've got a bit of that context, I would then, you know, go review the patient. And the main thing in the history is, I think, you know, are they symptomatic? So when patients become very hypertensive, they might be drowsy or lethargic. So that can show, you know, that can, I guess, show the severity of the hypotension, as well as some other symptoms which may indicate the cause of the hypertension. So, for example, if they have chest pain or palpitations, you might be thinking about a cardiac cause. If they have dys dysuria, you may be thinking of urosepsis, for example. And once you've got a, got a bit of that history, going into the examination and from the end of the bed, really thinking about, you know, is this patient critically unwell? Are they, you know, slightly sick or are they well? Just to help kind of flag and categorize for yourself. From there, you're looking at the vital signs. The heart rate is it irregular versus regular because then that, again, maybe leans towards a cardiac cause. And then doing a the general A to E assessment. Obviously, you, know, you, you don't have to go through every single thing like as you do on an OSCE, um, but just um, ticking off, you know, the big ticket items and really, uh, you know, targeting it towards what you think the differential might be. And then going to the um, differential diagnosis, I think the big red flag for the, the hypotensive patient is shock. So you got your distributive, hypovolemic, obstructive, and cardiac causes of shock. This isn't an exhaustive list at all, but I think these are some of the red flags that you can think of on the ward and just you want to tick off in your mind just to make sure, you know, none of these things are, are, are occurring. And if they are, to get the appropriate management and escalation started. But say, you know, those red flag things are potentially ruled out. I think the common things that I see are dehydration. So, you know, obviously patients, they come to hospital, they're sick, they're not eating and drinking as they normally would. Them to be dehydrated is quite common. Or, for example, if they're fasting for a scan or for a surgical procedure, again, dehydration is quite common. Sometimes just nocturnal variation or the patient's baseline. So looking at their general trend is important. And also incorrect medications is a massive one. So patients will come in, they'll get admitted, they haven't had a pharmacy reconciliation yet. And, you know, you've only got, you know, the previous discharge summary or something like that to base their medication on. The patient doesn't know their dosages. So it's quite common to have incorrect medication um, charted as a cause as well. And then going into the management plan, this is a general list of things to consider. Um, you don't have to do all these things. It, it is targeted to what the presentation is and the context. But I think a bedside, like ECG for most patients is, you know, quite high yield and quite easy to do. A VBG, if you think that there's any of those differentials of shock. You know, urine dipstick, if you think there might be, you know, a urinary tract infection. And some of those other things, are, again, are targeted to what you think the differential might be. So if they're septic, you do your full septic workup. Um, you know, urine, uh, blood cultures, bloods, chest x-ray, et cetera. If you think it's a cardiac cause, you might do a troponin. Um, I've chucked in the QSOFA score as well. I think that's a nice way just to think about sepsis. I'd, I'm not sure how they teach things in different states, but at ANU, um, they talked a lot about like SOFA and QSOFA scores. 
um, as a marker for sepsis. I think the SOFA score is like very complicated to do and not something you would do on the ward at all. But the QSOFA score is something you can easily do on MD Cal. Basically, it looks at um, if they have hypotensive, have altered mental status or tachypnea. And if they have two or more of those and any symptoms to suggest an infection, then sepsis is higher up on your on your differentials. And it's just a nice thing to document in your notes just to you know, show that you're thinking about that and you're either ruling it in or ruling it out. And then, yeah, going into the management plan. So I think broadly, like I, we, we've done that end of the bed assessment, are they well or unwell? For any unwell patient, you know, calling on met call and starting basic life support is essentially what you need to do. You're there to, you know, initially assess the patient, triage them, and start the basic management. If they're unwell, I think calling a med call, and if you can do maybe things like getting a cannula in and started some taking some bloods, you're already ahead of the game, and you know everyone would be quite happy with um, with what you've done at that point. So yeah, so that's the unwell patient. If there if you, there's any concerns of sepsis, again, I think that's something you should escalate. So you can just notify your ward registrar, and again potentially start some basic sepsis management. So get a cannula in, ask the nursing staff to get a gas, start some of your septic screen start some simple management like fluids and oxygen um, and then getting to the registrar just to give you some further advice on where to go to after that. I put in in there like referring to ICU and art lines and vasopressors. This would be more a registrar to registrar discussion, but just to flag that if patients who are septic and if they're not getting better on the ward, then this may be an escalation. Just to be aware, these are the things that may happen. But if you're worried and getting to that point, I think definitely you'd be discussing with your registrar and they can make the appropriate referral from there. But to take away those, um, you know, those more red flag and severe conditions. The big one, you know, I find is, yeah, the asymptomatic hypotensive patient. So, yeah, it, it does depend on the context. But, for instance, if they're a little bit unwell um, and they haven't been ha having much fluid intake, you can encourage oral fluid intake and seeing if that improves things. But if obviously they're fasting or they're nil by mouth and you're going to have to go through the um, IV route. So a 250 to 500 ml fluid bolus is completely appropriate to do. Obviously, if the patient's elderly and frail, you might go on the lower end. If they're you know older, if they're young and very well, you might go on the higher end. But giving them a fluid bolus, getting the nursing staff to recheck the blood pressure and going from there is quite a you know simple and effective management. Um, also, I mentioned before, like looking at the medications, it's also reasonable to withhold the next dose of their antihypertensive. I think as a ward cover, that's you know completely appropriate to do. But I wouldn't um, like withholding the dose is fine, but I wouldn't completely cease the dose. I would just put a note in, you know, withheld um, the next dose of you know whatever metoprolol, given the patient was a bit um, hypertensive. Home team to review and consider further management. Letting the home team to, to do the further management um, is ideal. So. So, yeah, withholding a single dose is fine. Um, I have put a note there, just beware of withholding furizomide because from what I heard from lots of gen med registrars, furizomide, like especially the lower doses, don't really lower the blood pressure that much. So withholding it might not give you much of a benefit, but it can tip them into APO quite quickly. So just being careful with that one. And if at any point you're concerned or worried, escalating and discussing with your registrar. And then... I'll put in for arrhythmias as well. I think if any patient is hypotensive and has an arrhythmia, that's like essentially they're hemodynamically unstable. Definitely, you know, met call or escalating to your reg if they're close by. Not something that we would be expected to manage um, as a junior for sure. And then a follow-up plan just as a safety net. So, you know, putting in the notes, asking the nursing staff to review the OB, say, in an hour, just to assess the response to treatment. If they're not improving or you're, you're worried, then escalating to your registrar will be the next point of call. So that's hypotension. Does anyone have any questions about the approach to hypotension before we go to the next one? All good? All right, let's go to hypertension. So um, I might ask if there's anyone at all that wants to volunteer, just some general you know, points in this. It doesn't have to go through absolutely everything. Just you know, just some general important points, or you know, any ideas on how to approach hypertension by a kind volunteer. I guess I can have a go. <laughs> yeah, please, thank you. Yep. Uh, so I think the main thing here would be just uh, assuming I'm a GMO taking a call, 
So the first thing I will ask the nurse would be, is the patient currently uh, unresponsive or having neurological deficits? And then ask for the patient's current vitals and uh, what are the, some of the presenting symptoms? Mm -hmm. And then I will proceed to uh, look at the uh, label record to see if there are any, uh, what's the reason of this patient presenting to the hospital. If this uh, this is a surgical patient, then it can be a response to pain. If it is like a medical patient, then the patient may be having a stroke and then it's uh, post-stroke management, then I should refer it to the registrar or it can be anything else that I'm not sure. So I will check and see the current medication to see if uh, anything that would cause this um, uh, potentially be predisposed to hypertension and then I'll go to sort of assess the, if the patient so just do the basic history and examination to see if there are anything that's salient <laughs> and yeah that's what I can think of for now. That's excellent. Um, I think it's really good that you mentioned um, like at the start like are they a surgical patient are they a medical patient like getting that context um, is super important to help yeah differentiating, you know, how you're going to assess a patient and what the potential differentials are. So, yeah, so for hypertension, as you said, so over the phone, getting some symptoms, you know, is a patient in pain, do they have a headache, you know, is there chest pain, is there anything that would suggest a possible cause or complication of hypertension? And as you mentioned about the medication as well, so have they taken the medication today? And I think a simple thing they can ask the nursing staff to do is get a blood, get a manual blood pressure or at least repeat the blood pressure. Um, and then, as you mentioned, the medical records, so looking for why they've come in, so what's the reason for admission? Are they a surgical? Are they a medical patient? Do they have any past medical history of hypertension or medications? And it's super common that, um, so like patients will come in, they're just their antihypertensive medication just hasn't been charted. And again, like they might come in from ED, you've got a busy ward, lots of patients on your bed cards, the pharmacy rec hasn't been done, they just haven't been charted their antihypertensive medication or the dose is missed, um, et cetera. So that's, a, that's another one to, to look out for. Looking at the general blood pressure trend and then looking at any investigations that may have been done, particularly thinking about like the renal function because acute renal failure can lead to, lead to hypertension as well. And then, yeah, going into the patient review, so targeted history and examination. I think the big thing in the history is, again, are they symptomatic or are they asymptomatic? Some of this, so when you kind of get into severe hypertension or like hypertensive emergencies and hypertensive urgencies, they have that kind of different classification. Um, they start to get symptoms and they may have symptoms of end organ dysfunction. That's when you start to get to the hypertensive emergency category, which is like kind of met call realms. Some of these symptoms may be like headaches, blurred visions, you know, focal neurology, et cetera. Or there may be some cardiac symptoms such as, you know, chest pain, back pain, fluid overload, et cetera. Any signs of, of end organ um, failure. And as you also mentioned about pain, so, yeah, are there any acute reversible precipitants? So, you know, are they, are they post-surgery and have uncontrolled pain? Are they in urinary retention, et cetera? This can be an a important point and it's something that we can easily rectify for the patient. Going into the examination, we mentioned you know repeating the blood pressure, looking for any sites of pain, so palpating the abdomen, you know, do they have a full bladder, etc. Doing like a, I think a neurological exam is important, especially specifically if they're very hypertensive and have any kind of signs of of neurological side effects uh, or complications, sorry. And then doing a cardiovascular exam as well, just to rule out some red flag conditions. And then similarly in the differentials, I think having your red flags on one side and your common things. And again, this is not an exhaustive list of red flags to consider, but broadly speaking, things like you know, an aortic dissection, an acute coronary syndrome, you mentioned a stroke or a subarachnoid hemorrhage. These are the things that you want to be ticking off in your mind. And then after those things are kind of put on the back burner and you're confident with that, thinking about some of the common things. So I mentioned, you know, medications being withheld or not started and pain being another big one. And then going into the management plan, so having that that same framework of some investigations and then and then basic management to get started. The investigations yeah, will be targeted to what you think or what you find in the history in the examination. So an ECG and troponins, for example, if they have chest pain, getting some basic bloods. And then considering of imaging as well. I think as a rule for imaging, which has 
like significant, um, like a, a quite invasive, so like high radiation dose, need contrast, et cetera, logistically are more complicated to organise. I think they should probably be run by a registrar. I wouldn't be like ordering like a CTTA, for instance, if I think of an aortic dissection without talking to my registrar first. I think that's like common sense essentially. And then going in, so once those initial investigations are thought about and ordered and, and, and spoken to your registrar if needed, then starting some basic basic management. Any reversible cause should be addressed. So if they're in pain, you know, giving them appropriate analgesia, and if that's not working, um, despite, you know, you know, regular and appropriate analgesia, thinking about discussions with APMS, for example, any infection being managed, you know, if they're in neurotension, putting an IDC in, all these reversible things should be addressed first. And then for the asymptomatic hypertensive patient, um, I guess, like, I, I think when you get a page, it's like you, I, I always get the feeling like oh, I need to fix this situation, I need to treat this condition, but you don't always need to treat like treat every single condition. And it's fine if you, as long as you call the nursing staff and just reiterate your thoughts to them and let them and let them know that look, you know, a once off blood pressure, high blood pressure is okay, then it's only one say one sixty over ninety. Let's monitor them and see if you know if the blood pressure returns down. Specifically, if they're asymptomatic, um, they've had normal blood pressures before. I think I think that's fine to do. If the blood pressure is you know quite high or um, the blood pressure remains high despite observing, giving a stat dose of a medication is also appropriate. And then asking the nursing staff to recheck the blood pressure in an hour um, and to page you to let you know what the blood pressure is. And then if that's fine for the home team to then follow up and consider, you know, long-term antihypertensive management. I wouldn't be starting, you know, regular antihypertensive medication as a cover, um, but a stat dose is fine. Common things that I've seen used charted is Ramipril, you know, five milligrams, small dose of nifidipine, prazosin as well I've seen used quite, quite effectively, but as a, you know, side effect just to watch for hypotension and also GTN patches as well. And the good thing about GTN patches is you can, like, put in the order comments, you know, to remove once the blood pressure is less say, than, say, 160 over 100. So it gives the nursing staff an idea as well of when they can remove the GTM patch. And, I, again, all of these things I'll just do as a once-only order and ask the home team to follow up, you know, um, in terms of long-term management. So that's the asymptomatic hypertensive patient. For symptomatic hypertension, I think, I think it's prudent to call the registrar for advice. So they've, if they have anything like such as head, your headache, dizziness, really if they, if, if they have any focal neurological findings, then that's kind of a more, you know, urgent um, matter. Any cardiac, you know, chest pain, et cetera, I think just call the registrar just so you're safe. Um, there is a diff, like a category of um, different hypertensive severity. So if the blood pressure is more than 180, um, they're symptomatic, but there's no signs of end organ damage, that's considered a hypertensive urgency. And it's quite nicely written out in ETG. Um, but essentially for that category, the aim is for gradual reduction of blood pressure with oral medication over a couple of days. So it's not like an, a, a really, really um, like emerging um, condition. But if the blood pressure is greater than 220 or there's any signs of end organ damage, then that's hypertensive emergency. And that's essentially a met call. Um, and... The aim will be in that situation is for IV antihypertensive medications and a gradual, a, a slow reduction of blood pressure in the first couple of hours, and then a gradual reduction in the next two to six hours. And the rationale for that is that if you reduce the blood pressure too quickly, any of those like um, vascular beds that have auto-regulated, um, you essentially don't give them time to regulate again, and it can lead to ischemic damage in vascular beds. So they um, they promote a, a slow reduction in the blood pressure, but. At that point, that's definitely um, kind of registrar territory. Um, and as long as you've identified it and, and called the MET call, you know, you've definitely done your job from there. Um, and then the follow-up plan. So, yeah, I think asking if you started a medication, for example, or you've said just to monitor it for now, rechecking the blood pressure in an hour or two, consider a second dose. Um, and if they're not improving, escalation to the, um, to the, to the ward registrar. Is there any questions about hypertension before we go to the next one? Actually, um, just one question with end organ damage. So just to clarify, do you mean um, just like focal neurological deficits, visual loss, like that kind of stuff? Or yeah, so, uh, yeah, I think um, so. Like things like 
focal neurological deficits would indicate, like I guess, like brain as an end organ damage, but also things like APO indicating the heart is failing. If on bloods they've got a new AKI, if their urine output is really low, would indicate renal failure. So kind of they're the broad systems that you'd be looking at um, as an indicator for end organ damage. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. I just misread the slide. Yeah, all good. Thanks. <laughs> uh, no worries. Thank you. All righty. Let's go to tachycardia. So is there anyone um, that watched for well, Yeah, again, just some brief or um, brief points that they want to talk about for tachycardia. Any volunteers? Yeah, so I'll just same thing as before, really. So just consider if they're symptomatic or asymptomatic. Um, if there's a change in blood pressure, if they're hypotensive or hypertensive, Again, if there's any end organ diffusion, like we said before, the same thing as before. Um, look at the trend. Look at the baseline. See if the tachycardia is regular or irregular in ECG. Look at the previous cardiac history, AF history. Um, and, yeah, you just get the regular. You just do the same investigations you did last time. Um, some common things you think of is sinus tachy, if it's fever, sepsis, if there's compensation for hypertension, like a PE, pain, anxiety, alcohol withdrawal miss beta blocker or something, um, or if they have AF or A flutter or something. So you consider the cause of those as well. So it just depends what's driving tachycardia. Yeah, that's excellent, mate. I think you've pretty much nailed everything. Um, yeah, as you said, so over the phone, you're asking are they well or unwell and what are the other observations, any symptoms which you mentioned. You mentioned regular versus irregular as well, which is a big one, and organizing the ECG. So if you can get those things ticked off, you know, at the start, you're already, you know, you're already on the ball and 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 you're doing well. Um, while those things are getting done in the in the um, in the background, looking at the medical records, so looking for getting some context again, what why they've been admitted, any recent ward round notes. Do they have any known arrhythmias in their past um, medical history? Has the medication actually been charted? Yeah, again, quite common patient gets admitted, they've got AF, their metoprolol, for instance, hasn't been charted, now they're in rapid AF, for example. Um, looking at the other OBS, are they hypotensive, are they febrile? Um, and I think for it's important to look at the investigations as well because electrolyte disturbances are a common cause um, of arrhythmias um, and something that we can easily correct. Then on the patient review, again, as you mentioned, any symptoms, and yeah, because there's so many causes of tachycardia, you'd really be tailoring your questions to you know the probable causes and any red flags, really based on your medical record review and the reason for their admission. On the examination, looking from the end of the bed, do they look to be well or unwell? Looking at the vital signs, if the patient's tachycardic and all their other vitals are you know are deteriorating, you know, calling a met call um, essentially will be the next step. And then for your differentials, there's so many causes of tachycardia, but I think if you can broadly divide into cardiac versus non-cardiac causes, within cardiac, thinking about arrhythmias, within non-cardiac, thinking about you know pretty much absolutely everything else, there's so many causes of sinus tachy or AF. Um, and so there's a lot of things to think about, but hopefully that initial medical record review will help provide that context to, to really hone in on certain things. And not neglecting yet yeah, pain and, and and psychological state, as you mentioned. Then going into the management plan, so you're starting with your investigation. So you've asked the nursing staff to do an ECG. By the time you've got there, you've got the ECG. You can have a read of it. Comparing it to previous ECGs is important as well. And then consideration of some re of some blood tests, particularly if they haven't any recent bloods. Getting you know a general screen, and specifically your electrolytes as well, is important, as well as your thyroid function tests. And obviously, if they have chest pain or you think it's a cardiac cause, getting some troponins. And then considering imaging, depending on what your differentials are, and you mentioned a PE as well, so consideration of a CTPA. But I would, before ordering a CTPA, given, yeah, it's a relatively invasive imaging technique and, and logistically it involves a fair bit, I'd be talking to the registrar before ordering a CTPA. Um, I think a good principle for management is anything other than a sinus tachycardia, you should probably get some advice for. Um, sinus tachy, I think, you know, we can manage as, as the interns, particularly if you're getting towards, you know, you know, a bit further down um, in the year and you're getting more confident, like things like hypovolemia, pain, you know, these are things that we can start some management um, and then have a chat to our registrar after. But if there's, uh, you know, anything else in a sinus, um, sinus tachy, I think we should be talking to the registrar early. Obviously, some of these things within sinus tachy, though, if you think the patient's septic or if they've got a PE, et cetera, then then you'd be talking to the registrar earlier rather than later. 
So that's sinus tachy, essentially identify and treat the cause. If it's not working, escalate. Um, for rapid AF, usually when the patient's in rapid AF, there usually is some underlying trigger. So there's a big emphasis on managing the underlying cause. Um, just the other day, we had a like 86 year old come in, um, and they were like they weren't known to have AF, which is odd for an 86 year old. Most of them do have some type of arrhythmia, but um, they were 86 in AF, and they were like they had urosepsis, and literally within one day of IV antibiotics and giving some fluids, the AF had reverted and it was fine. So I think it really highlights the importance of managing the underlying cause. Um, if they're known to have AF and they just, you know, for instance, haven't had their usual dose of their rate control, then I think it's fine for us to instigate that management and have a chat to the registrar as long as their blood pressure and other OBS are stable. can also consider giving a stat dose, like extra dose of their rate control, so, you know, an additional 25 milligrams of metoprolol, for instance, or if their next dose is only like in another hour or two, just bringing that a little bit earlier and having a chat to the registrar. and then. If that's still not working, there is things to escalate. So you can consider like loading doses of digoxin or um, IV um, magnesium. But at this point, I'd be discussing this with the registrar. I think this is out of the realms of, you know, intern management. Um, for things like any wide complex tachycardia, you know, straight away you know, registrar or met call, and I'd be asking the nurse just to get the DFib pads ready um, just in case. And if there, I mentioned before, if there's any unstable observations, I think, yeah, again, uh, calling a met call and asking the nurse just to get the DFib pads ready, getting things like IV access sorted if it hasn't, um, just so you're just so you're prepared if they deteriorate. And then follow-up plan. So, you know, if there's no improvements on review, say, you know, in an hour or two, then again, just feeling comfortable to escalate that to, um, to the next senior available. Is there any um, any questions about tachycardia? I've got a small question, mate. Mm -hmm. So say someone's got rapid AF, like a new rapid AF that I didn't have, and you look for underlying triggers, you can't find any, and the patient is not in like, you know, they're not decompensated and their blood pressure is good. Could you start a metoprolol yourself for like an AF that you take the first time without speaking to a reg or speak with the reg first and then start it? Yeah, I think if it's a new AF and there's no underlying cause that you've identified, I think I think I would probably speak to the registrar because, um, yeah, sure, they probably will start metoprolol or something like that, but I think it's worth speaking to the registrar because there's no obvious thing, reasons to why they, they've gone into it. So it may need some further investigation, some some further management, and they probably potentially may want to speak to cardio for things like organising and inpatient echo and that kind of stuff. Um, so I think it's worth talking to the registrar in that situation. Sweet. Cheers, mate. No worries. Okay. Let's go to hypoxemia, low oxygen saturations. Um, any volunteers for some thoughts on on hypoxemia? Yeah, sure. I guess on the phone, as you said before, just, you know, is the patient well or unwell? Um, vitals, uh, recent vitals, um, and if they're symptomatic as well. So if they're, you know, tachypneic, increased work of breathing, um, you know, if there's anything... Uh, ultimate mental status, that kind of thing. Uh, and then potentially um, uh, uh, potentially based off what they're saying, you know, just try and get some a repeat set of vitals um, and then come review. Uh, from there, probably just thinking about like red flags. Uh, for me, probably thinking like PE, if it's like acute onset, um, potentially could be asthma COPD exacerbations, um, could be decompensated heart failure. Um, and uh, probably even APO as well. Oh, that's probably related to the heart failure. But yeah, um, thinking about a few other things, maybe diet, like ketoacidosis as well. Um, I'm not sure if that would cause low oxygen. But um, yeah, and then just kind of going through the med rec uh, and just seeing, you know, what's the story of this patient? Are they surgical identical? Um, and then just doing some investigations as well. But um, yeah, potentially giving them puffers if they have any uh, and if they need them. Um, but that's depending on the story as well. So, yeah, yeah, excellent. I think again, I think you've you've hit most of the important points. That's great. So yeah, as you said over the phone, are they well or unwell? What are the other observations? I think getting a time course is good to see is this like acute onset or is it something that's gradually been occurring? To that probably helps guide the severity. And are there any other symptoms? Are they drowsy? What's their GCS? And asking the nursing staff, yeah, are they on room air or any oxygen supplementations? And if they aren't, 
can we increase this, you know, and titrate this up until I get there? But obviously being aware, as you mentioned, you mentioned COPD. So being aware, you know, if the patient does have COPD, if they're a CO2 retainer, then our targets are different, 88 to 92%. But yeah, if they're otherwise not, then asking them to put some oxygen on by the time you get there. And yeah, you mentioned the the medical record review, which is you know, completely correct. If you want to look for why they're admitted, things like big ticket items will be any respiratory condition or any cardiac condition, which may be a cause for their hypoxemia. Looking at the ward round notes, because commonly in the ward round notes, they they like if the patient is known to have um, issues with their saturations, usually they, they have something in in the plan like targets of eighty eight to ninety percent bracket CO2 retain or something like that. So it helps guide what you're actually targeting for your oxygen. And sometimes, you know, because some of the notes can be quite extensive, the nursing staff may miss that. So it's important just to have a read just so, so you know that so you know the context in your own mind. And then looking at their past medical histories, things like yes, yeah, COPD, heart failure, looking at their general trend, then looking at their medications. So we can see it's essentially the same, it's essentially the same process for, for most of the presentations, you know, reason for admission, ward round notes, past medical history, OBS, and what are their medications so far. Some things to think about in their medications, if they had too much opioids, so the ventilatory drive is reduced, and they had too much IV fluids, which is unfortunately quite common in the hospital, and they're an APO now, or they missed their fruzimide dose, for instance. So these are just some things to consider. And then you're yeah, going to assess the patient. So you know, getting a targeted history, do they feel short of breath? Has this come on quickly or slowly? Do they have any other symptoms which may point to a, a system that's causing this, any chest pain, you know, any coughing, carousal symptoms for respiratory, et cetera? And then doing your examination. The examination is really, yeah, again, looking from the end of the bed, do they look to be, yeah, you know, well, sick or critical? What's their G GCS? Um, the vital signs as well, look, sometimes um, because, you know, maybe they've got nail polish or they've got poor peripheral perfusion, um, the finger probe might not be reading properly, might be getting a bad trace. So using the ear probe that's in that scenario just to confirm what the, what the actual saturations are. And then going through your kind of ABC um, assessment, um, in breathing, we, there's that rates mnemonic, which is used in um, ALS, so respiratory rate, auscultate, tracheal deviation, effort of breathing, and SATs. Um, and C, looking for things like, yeah, like, as you mentioned, like APO, fluid overload. And then the legs, um, looking for signs of peripheral edema or signs of a DVT, so like asymmetrical leg swelling, calf pain, et cetera. And then, yeah, you mentioned that, again, correctly in the differentials, you have your red flags and your common things. So your red flags are like cardiac things, for instance, acute coronary syndromes, arrhythmias, APO, respiratory things, like the PE, pneumothorax, severe asthma. And obviously the, the very, like the septic patient can also present with um, hypoxemia. But then, you know, those things, that, that's one category. They're looking at the common things, a poor trace, which I mentioned, just like having COPD or asthma that hasn't been treated or that's kind of exacerbated a little bit, or if they're in heart failure. So then going into your management, um, so like you can do a well score, which I think is good to document. So you've got that there. Um, and it's not really like an investigation, I guess, but just putting the well score there, you can easily do on an MD calc and just writing it down. You know, if you're in the high risk area, then you'd be for imaging. If you're in low risk, you do your PERC. And if that's positive, then you've got to do a D dimer. So just going through that algorithm. Um, and then you have, yeah, you have your bedside test, bloods, imaging, other tests. Um, ECG, if you think it might be an arrhythmia, BSLs, a VBG, if you think there may be um there may be uh, like a respiratory, like a type one or type two respiratory failure. I think technically you need an ABG for that, but I think you know, for our scenario as an intern, getting a VBG is fine. And if the registrar once an ABG, then you can uh, get that organized. But starting with the uh, bl uh, venous blood gas is perfectly fine. Um, and then you have your yeah, bloods and imaging. So again, it's targeted to what you think may be causing it. So if you think the patient's uh, getting septic, get doing your organizing your septic screen, if you think they're in heart failure, potentially organizing a BMP, and then imaging again targeted. So a, a CTPA, even if you do your wells and perk stuff, I think it's still worth. Uh, discussing uh, doing a CTPA with your registrar first um, before um, getting that organized. But a chest x-ray is something you can do high yield, you know, very low radiation. So I think a chest x-ray for most cases of hypoxemia should be done. Then in terms of the management plan, 
there are just general things that we can do to help manage hypoxemia. Then there's specific things depending on the condition. Easy things that we can get started is like getting them in the right position. So getting them upright for APO. Apparently for COVID, proning or lateral lie um, is ideal. I also, an ICU registrar just the other day actually told me as well, you know, if you look, if you walk around ICU, a lot of the patients are at 30 degrees. And apparently that's because the FRC improves a fair bit with getting them at 30 degrees. So just simple positioning will help um, with the hypoxemia as well. So that's one thing that we can easily do. Next thing we can do is supplemental oxygen. So for most patients that don't have a history of COPD and the blood gas doesn't show they're a CO2 retainer, then aiming for above 94% and titrating the supplementation for that. But if or if they are they do have COPD, they're a chronic CO2 retainer, then aiming for 88 to 92%. So that's general stuff. Looking at specific things um, for APO, I think you know if the patient obviously has APO, they've come in for heart failure, you know, they're acutely decompensated, given 40 milligrams of IV furosemide. Um, something we can get started and then having it uh, calling the reg and, and asking them for further advice for you know GTM patch whether they need um, positive pressure ventilation um, and an EMR order for strict fluid balance can also be done so it actually pops up on the nursing staff's um, job list of things to do just so we can monitor them long term so that's kind of things we can get organized and started for APO and then the home team just putting in the notes home team to follow up you know ongoing juristas and ongoing management and they can follow up the rest of that but asthma or acute exacerbations of COPD, um, as you also mentioned, getting them started on Sapapa, so salbutamol, plus or minus the ipratropium burst, um, burst therapy, um, and thinking about prednisolone as well. There's different um, severities for asthma and, um, and COPD. ETG has a really nice breakdown of like mild to moderate versus severe. For mild to moderate, you'd start maybe just salbutamol. For severe, you'd also add in ipratropium and prednisolone. And it's kind of more um, related to your um, initial assessment, can they speak in sentences? Um, do they have a, a, a normal GCS? Is their work of breathing minimal, et cetera? And that can just help, um, yeah, differentiate the two severities and and assign the appropriate management. And I, guess, I think that's for that. I think that's what we, we could get started for the management plan. And then follow up wise, um, we can ask for hourly observations just to monitor the oxygen saturation, make sure our management's working. We've ordered some bloods, you know, chasing the bloods and reviewing them in an hour. And if there's no improvement, then again, escalating to your registrar or calling a met call. Now, I'm just put a little like little flow chart of some of the different types of ventilation that we can um, provide, like the different grades, I guess. Broadly speaking, ventilation will be divided into like invasive and non-invasive. And obviously, invasive is like things like endotracheal intubation. Um, Whereas non-invasive things can be graded from like low flow nasal prongs, which is something we'll commonly commonly see on the wards. You can get it to like you know four to six liters, for instance. A Hudson mask, six to eight liters. A non-rebreather up until like fifteen liters, and then high flow nasal prongs. Um, and then from there, there's non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, which is CPAP or BiPAP. The things that I have commonly seen on the wards is low flow nasal prongs, pretty much, and sometimes a Hudson mask. As patients get more unwell, then you might see things like a non-rebreather or a high-flow nasal prongs. But I think as an intern, we can feel comfortable starting with some low-flow nasal prongs or a Hudson mask and then having a chat to our registrar if they're not improving um, and getting the appropriate escalation plan from there. Um, I think that's about it for hypoxemia. Any questions or ideas, thoughts on that? Sorry, I've got a couple of quick questions, mate. Um, yeah. On the wards, not an ICU, on the wards, what is what are the indications for getting ABG for a hypoxic patient? From what I've experienced, every time I speak to respiratory, they always want an ABG. So I think it's mainly the respiratory physicians that want an ABG. I think the main indication they want is to look at the um, – get an accurate um, oxygen um, saturation level um, because the VBG doesn't um, represent that accurately. Um, I've also – I've also seen like even though the VBG show can show CO2 relatively accurately, you know, some respiratory teams want an ABG still. Um, but I think that's kind of the main indication to get that accurate oxygen um, level reading. Apart from that, especially in critical care scenarios, VBGs are usually used. So in my experience, 
the registrars have always asked for a blood a venous blood gas first. And if we're starting to get to these areas where we think that there's significant respiratory failure and we've had a chat to um, respiratory, they'll normally want an ABG. But I think from our scenario, starting with a VBG is probably appropriate. Yep, yep, that makes sense. And I guess my second question was with the COPD, um, you know, CO2 retainer. Yeah. So if you yeah. don't know if someone's a CO2 retainer, you know, they have COPD. Mm. And if you get a VBG, um, you see an elevated bicarb, yeah. right? So it's indicating mm. to us them being a retainer. Mm. What would you do in that circumstance? Would you just go for more than 94% just because you don't actually know? Or would you try and aim for 88 to 92% in that case? Yeah, so the the, the bicarb element will elevate to a different degree depending if it's acute or chronic. So as a general rule of thumb, so if the CO2 is elevated and the bicarb is elevated, so if the bicarb is elevated um, by four or more for every 10 of the CO2 being elevated, is probably chronic. If it's only elevated by around one for every 10 of CO2, it's probably acute. And also you can look at the pH. If the pH is normal, then it's probably, and the bicarb is elevated like by four or more, it's definitely going to be chronic. The pH is still acidotic, then it might be acute. So I think that can give you a general guide as to whether it's chronic or acute. And based on those things, if they're if it's chronic, I would then aim for 88 to 92 percent. If they're if it's not if it's acute, then um, then you could aim higher. But I would be discussing that with the like with have a, have a chat to your registrar. If there's no clear documentation or previous VBGs to show whether they're acute or chronic, just having a quick phone call to your reg will help clarify that and you can go through the test together if you're concerned. Yeah, sweet. Cheers, mate. Alrighty. So I think that covers hypoxemia. All right. Let's do hyperglycemia now. So hopefully hyper hypoglycemia we can go through um, relatively quickly. Anyone want to volunteer just for some thoughts on hyperglycemia? Um, yeah, I, I can give it a go. So over the phone, I think I would just ask them the same questions that we've been asking so far, whether they're well or unwell. Um, are they symptomatic? Like, do they have any GI, um, or, I'm sorry, abdominal pain? Or is that just a one-off recording and they're just asymptomatic? Um, and then their most recent blood sugar levels. Um, and then um, I'm not really sure what I asked them to do over the phone, but I'd go to the patient and then do a medical record review and then see why they're admitted under what which ward um, also they're admitted. Um, and then what is, um, do they have a history of diabetes and what are their current medications? So what is their insulin um, regime? Um, what are their other viral signs as well? Um, and then I'll do a patient review. So I'll just see, um, are, are they drowsy? Um, what's their GCS? Do they have any other symptoms such as um, abdo pain, chest pain? Um, and then do an exam, which is just going to be a bit of a, I guess, sort of like a primary survey, but then a big emphasis on E um, and checking their blood glucose levels myself um, and GCS, as well as their temperature and any other um, sort of symptoms. I guess my DDXs would be sort of, um, it's probably going to be either a missed insulin, insulin dose is probably what's most likely, but also just having a look at their diet and see whether they're on a, um, on a diabetes diet or have they had anything that's not consistent with that. Um, and then I guess my management would sort of, again, just be similar in that um, I would do their blood sugar levels. I'd check their urine as well, do a dipstick, um, check their ketones, um, and then send, send off some bloods as well. Again, depends on how hyperglycemic they are. Um, and yeah, I think, um, I, yeah, I'm not really sure about the medications because yeah, I just have to do a bit of a review and um, chat with the reg as well to see whether they need to titrate their dose of insulin if they are diabetic. Excellent. Thank you for, for going through all that. That was great. So as you mentioned, yeah, so over the phone, um, getting some information. So, yeah, they're type 1 and type 2 diabetic. Um, what are their BGL and ketones? And I think, yeah, as you talked about meals as well. So what was the time of their last meal? So quite commonly what will happen is um, – like ideally the nursing staff will check the BGLs for diabetics like pre-meal, but obviously, you know, they've got a lot of jobs as well and the the time of the blood sugar reading may, you know, may be off a bit. So they may get a BGL done like 30 minutes after their last meal. They just had all this cereal and stuff. Like obviously it's going to be really high, but part of the protocol for the nursing staff is that they have to page 
you know, the medical officer, if their BGL is higher than a certain level, they have their own escalation criteria. So you'll get lots of pages about hyperglycemia, even though, you know, they're completely asymptomatic and then maybe just after a meal. Um, but just to be aware of, of that. So getting that information over the phone. And then, you are know, looking at the medical record, as you said, just get that context, get that history, finding out if they're diabetic, what type it is, um, what their observations are, what the trend of the blood sugar's been whilst they've been admitted, and any medications. Um, so are they any on, on any oral hyp, um, hypoglycemic agents? Are they on insulin? Has that insulin dose been delayed? Um, again, for multiple reasons, the new stuffs are quite busy. And also an important one thing about it is steroids. So steroids can you know, increase the blood sugar significantly. Um, for example, someone comes in with an exacerbation of COPD, they're on like 50 milligrams of PRED or something, uh, that can bump up um, their blood sugar quite significantly. So just getting that medical record review done and then go on to review the patient. Yeah, and you talked about like are they symptomatic or asymptomatic. So some of the common symptoms of hyperglycemia, they might be thirsty, may have frequent urination, some blurred vision, and they're lightheaded because they become so polyuric and now that they're dehydrated. Doing the examination, looking at their GCS, are they confused or drowsy? Any signs of hypovolemic shock due to that um, that dure, osmotic diuresis and, and assessing their fluid status. And then uh, the differentials for hyperglycemia, most commonly it's going to be something like benign, like they've just had a recent meal. Um, hospital food is super sugary as well. Like I don't think it's very good for you, to be honest. Um, super, super sugary, lots of purees and that kind of stuff. So not uncommon for someone who's got relatively okay controlled blood sugar levels in the community to come into hospital and now it's all out of whack and the blood sugars pop up a fair bit. Things like steroids, which you mentioned, and also just in general infections can cause an increase in your blood sugar as well due to that um, sympathetic kind of drive. Um, and any missed medications and, and when are they due? Can we start them a little bit earlier potentially? So that's the initial part. Then going into the um, investigation, so yeah, BGL and ketones. If the ketones are more than one, then it will be prudent to get a VBG to look for any sign of ketoacidosis. In that in that similar vein, if you you know if they're if they're quite hyperglycemic, they've got high ketones. Thinking about getting an ECG if you're worried of hyperkalemia and an arrhythmia. And if you think an infection's um setting it off, then getting a septic screen. But by and large, starting with the BGL and ketones is kind of your your go to. Just some general principles. You you do want to avoid a BGL more than 11. Um, but for elderly or pouty patients, you can become a lot more flexible with that. So BGL around 5 to 15 or so. So I'm on acute aged care now. It's not uncommon to see BGLs like 14, 15, 16, and we don't really do too much about it. In general, we aim for below 15 if they're more than 15, considering giving like two units of um, like a stat dose of Novo Rapid or something like that. Um, but yeah, being a bit more flexible with the elderly. And then, as I mentioned, a ketones greater than one is significant. And so getting a VBG at that point. In terms of the management plan, if they're in DKA, so if they're, you know, if they're type 1 diabetic, for instance, obviously DKA happens a lot more commonly in type 1 diabetes. And um, their BGLs, you know, more than 11, they're acidotic, um, and they have elevated ketones, then just call endo. Like if the patient DKA, it's quite simple in terms of management. You just get on the phone and call endo and get some advice. Um, Barring that, if the BGLs are just a little bit high, um, you know, around 11 to 15, but they're otherwise asymptomatic, just monitoring that is actually okay. Asking them to avoid sugary food and snacking um, and seeing if that kind of normalizes. But other than that, if the BGLs are consistently a little bit high, you'll want to get some management started. As a cover, giving just some a stat Novo Rapid or commencing an insulin sliding scale or supplemental insulin, as it's called, um, is also appropriate. And I think for someone who's insulin naive, so they've never had insulin before, going on the lower end of the sliding scale, so going to the two, four, and six. But if they've had insulin before, they're already on like a long-acting insulin, for instance, and they just need a bit more now because they're in hospital and they're on prednisolone, giving them the higher end, like the four, six, eight um, insulin sliding scale can help control those um, blood sugar levels. I would avoid... As you know, if you're a ward cover, I would avoid initiating oral hypoglycemic agents because that's like a long term thing, it's something that the home team can do. You know, you don't need to be responsible for that. I'd avoid reinstating withheld oral hypoglycemic agents because the home team may have a reason for why they withheld them. 
So, I'll, you know, I wouldn't really start that again. And I wouldn't increase regular dosing of oral hypoglycemia agents. That's, again, something the home team can do if they have, if they have persistently high sugars. I think starting, yeah, giving a stat dose or starting on a sliding scale as the cover um, would probably be, you know, kind of the limit of where you're going to. And then having a follow-up plan. So for type 1 diabetes, you have a lot more stringent follow-up. So, you know, one to two hourly OBS and BGL. For type 2 diabetes, you can be a bit more, um, diabetes can be more flexible. So two to four hourly OBS and BGLs and then getting the home team to review long-term management. Does that make sense? Any questions about hyperglycemia? Sweet. Let's go to hypoglycemia. So this, because the next one, um, low urine alcohol, that's probably a big one. So over the phone, again, asking for any symptoms and the big things you're thinking about for hypoglycemia, like are they drowsy, any altered mental status or any confusion? Again, are they type 1 or type 2 diabetic, just to give yourself some context and severity? And are they fasting or nil by mouth? Because that's going to have influence on your management plan further on. And so at least you've got that in the back of your mind while you're um, going to assess the patient. Similar thing in the medical record, get to the context, get the observations, what are their medications? So insulin is obviously quite important. Any oral agents and what are the dosing and time? So they just had it. Has there been a stacking of doses of the insulin? And what's the overall blood sugar trend? And then going to assess the patient. So again, the big thing is are they symptomatic? Um, for hypoglycemia, it has like the two separate phases. So in the early phase, they may have like sweating, palpitation, anxiety, and that kind of stuff um, due to increased sympathetic nervous system activation. And in the late stages, um, they start to get the neuroglycopenic symptoms where they start to get like paraseizures, confusions, lower GCS and stuff. And the patients, like for type diabetes, they're actually quite clued on to these symptoms. I remember when I was a dental student there was a we had a uh, diabetic patient who was on um, insulin and she was fasting for the dental procedure she thought she had to fast but she didn't but she still had her insulin so she was like in the dental chair like we're about to do a filling or something and she starts to feel like she starts to get quite sweaty starts to get the palpitations and so she knew she was becoming hypoglycemic she had her lollies and stuff and she like, started eating them straight away and they fixed it up pretty quickly so usually some of these patients who are long-standing diabetics they may be clued into their symptoms um, so it's a good marker um, as to what's going on. And then in terms of the examination, um, yeah, the GCS and their conscious state to see how severe um, down the track they are if they're in the neuroglycopenic phase. And also assessing you know, is the patient able to swallow because that's going to have um, uh, – it's going to influence your management later on. And then broadly speaking, your differentials. So, yeah, common things will be like on surgical wards, you're always getting pages about – you know, low BGLs and hypoglycemia because the patients are fasting, they're nil by mouth. And obviously, you know, they're going to become they're going to become hypoglycemic in that situation. Also, for unwell patients who have significant nausea and vomiting and have poor oral intake, that can be a common cause. And then insulin is is another common cause. So they're either too much insulin for their current food intake uh, or their time of insulin because, you know, again, the nursing staff may be busy and there's maybe stacking of doses or we may have charted incorrectly. So that's another thing to look out for. And then going into the investigations and management, so, yeah, getting a BGL, getting your ketones um, are your first point of call. And then starting your, your basic management. And really it's like, so if they have impaired consciousness then you're calling a met call slash code blue if you're worried that they're you know going to have an air airway compromise issue then you're calling a code blue and the initial management that you want to do is um you know while you're waiting for everyone to come getting an iv cannula in and getting organ getting the iv glucose organized um generally what well, at, at our hospital at anu it came in two general formulations so there's, there's a 250 mil the 10 percent glucose that can be given over 15 minutes or there's the 50 mil 50% glucose that can be given over five minutes. That 50 mil 50% one is like really, really thick. So it can be hard to administer, but it's quicker to administer than, than the 10% formulation. If you can't get IV access for whatever reason, then you can give um, intramuscular glucagon. So that's kind of the, the measure for the impaired um, conscious consciousness. If the patient is conscious and can eat though, then just feed the patient. So any, any fast acting, um, uh, glucose agents such as like uh, sweets, juice, soft drinks should be given first and then follow up with a sandwich or some complex carbohydrates and repeat the blood sugars just to make sure it's trending up. 
if they're conscious but unable to eat, so they're a surgical patient, for instance, at a nil by mouth, then going down the IV route again um, is the way to go. And you can follow that with like a 5% dextrose maintenance bag just to make sure they don't go hypoglycemic again. So they're kind of your, your general general management. Um, in this situation, if you're given, um, if the patient's um, being given too much insulin for their current like, ap- appetite or their current activity, you can reduce or withhold their dose, but I think it's very important to remember for type 1 diabetes, you should never withhold long-acting um, insulin because that can quickly push them into DKA. So, like for instance, if they're on a basal bolus regimen, then usually the, um, basal reg- the basal dose will continue, but you might reduce or stop the bolus dose. But it's kind of getting quite complicated um, um, kind of in that region. And so I'd discuss that with the registrar. I wouldn't be – like you wouldn't be responsible for making those decisions, I believe. Um, yeah, so for those kind of patients, just have a chat to your registrar and see what the most appropriate um, insulin regimen will be in the short term. And then follow-up. So – the BGLs should rise pretty quickly once you start the management. So rechecking them in 15 minutes and make sure they're rising appropriately. And once the BGL is more than four and the patient's well, there's no symptoms, you can then resume the regular monitoring, such as you know, QID monitoring. Um, but yeah, I think the big thing for hypoglycemia is that initial part, you know, are they conscious or not? And then are they able to swallow? Because that's going to influence your management overall. Any questions about hypoglycemia before we head off to the to the last one? Sorry, just with the conscious but unable to eat, how much IV glucose do we give? The conscious, uh, so for that one there, so you can give, for instance, like the 250 mil 10% glucose over 15 minutes. You can start with like a quicker dose. And if the blood sugar is coming up nicely, but they're still not like, you know, they're fasting for whatever reason for surgery, then you can give them just a slow bag of like eight to 10 hours, for instance. Oh, sweet. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Low urine output. So this one, like it's the slide, the the cards are pretty big in terms of all the information, but this is just, again, for reference, don't think you need to go through all this stuff, but just things to think about for patients with low urine output because there are so many different causes for it. Um, But when I get to the differentials, like I think if you broadly divide into two categories, it can help kind of um, give you a a better framework for, for managing these patients. So over the phone, Important questions to ask, you know, what's the volume of urine in the past 24 hours? So dividing into oliguria versus anuria, because that would then, um, you know, have uh, will change what you're thinking about in terms of differentials. Are they in pain? So uh, the big one we're thinking about acute urinary retention. What are their vital signs? And if they have an IDC, you want some information, you know, is the IDC flushing? If it's not, do you think there might be a blockage? What's the urine um, color in the the bag? Are there any clots, for instance, in it? And if it hasn't been done and nothing's recorded, getting a bladder scan will be important to see if they're in urinary retention. And also if they haven't got an IDC, just asking the nursing staff to get that set up because it can take a while to set all that stuff up. So it'll be better if that's all ready to go once you get there. Then going into the yeah, record review, looking for the reason for their admission, looking at their general urine output trends over the last 24 to 48 hours, their observations, so their blood pressure, particularly looking at, you know, are they you know, hypotensive, so then they've got poor renal perfusion, or are they hypertensive, or then they've got like acute renal failure, for instance. And then medication is a big one. So a lot of patients will be started on new medications when they're in hospital, and a lot of them can be nephrotoxic. And, you know, it's not uncommon for them to be already be on an ACE inhibitor and a diuretic and, you know, it can, it can be quite easily missed that they just get started on ibuprofen for some pain relief as well and now they've got that triple whammy happening and now they're, you know, um, they, they've got an AKI. And also antimicrobial is another big one that can cause an AKI. And looking at any recent blood, so looking at the renal function and the trend and potassium, like all electrolytes are important to look at, but potassium is a big one that can be affected uh, when you've got very poor urine output and um, and renal failure. Then reviewing the patient, yeah, any symptoms, are they symptomatic or asymptomatic, and then doing your general examination. It really is kind of like a top-to-toe exam for patients with low urine output because there's so many things that can be causing it. But doing your general things like are they well or unwell, they look to be shocked, are they particularly painful like in the suprapubic area, thinking about acute urinary retention, then doing your general things like a fluid balance exam, you know, 
cardiorespiratory exam, abdominal exam, looking for a tender bladder, et cetera, et cetera any kidney tenderness, which may um, indicate like a um, urinary tract infection, pyelonephritis, et cetera. And always looking at the um, IDC. So what's the color? Is it very, very concentrated? Is there any blood or clots? Now, is there lots of sediment in there, which may indicate a blockage? And of course, the volume, how much is actually draining? Um, and then dividing into the differentials, I think for you can think about like, is there oliguria or is there anuria? For patients who have anuria, usually there's just some type of blockage. So that helps to narrow things down. Is there a bladder outlet obstruction such as, you know, BPH? Is the IDC blocked? So any, any kinks, clots or sediment? So that's anuria. Then thinking about oliguria, basically anything that can impair renal function, so an AKI and, you know, as you would have learned in medical school, there's a pre-renal, intra-renal, and post-renal causes. And it really depends on, yeah, the circumstance and the context for why they've been admitted. Um, a lot of patients in ED will have, um, you know, mild AKIs due to like pre-renal causes, so dehydration, um, third space, and they just come with acute pancreatitis or they're septic. Um, so they're quite common causes. For patients who have been on the ward for a while, um, and they've got a new kind of AKI. And common cause is intrarenal because they've been started on new medications or like gentamicin or some antibiotic. That's nephrotoxic. And then, yeah, we talked about post-renal causes, so like anuria for the mechanical things, so for the blockages, but also some type of functional issues such as the UTI and sepsis and some drugs can cause post-renal causes. So then going into management, um, bedside, we talked about a bladder scan to see if they're in retention. If any of their bloods show that they're hyperkalemic, getting an ECG to see if there's any ECG changes. And a urine dipstick if they have some urine to see if there's any infection. Bloods and imaging can also be done. Again, CT, KUB, because um, I, I, would, I would have a chat to the registrar before ordering it, just because you know, there's no contrast for CT, KUB, but it is you know, still a logistically uh, significant investigation. So having a chat to the reg just to see if that's something that's warranted. And then your management plan. I think, um, yeah, if the patient's in acute urinary retention, placing an IDC as a matter of urgency is important. Not only is the patient in pain, um, but it can, yeah, can cause an AKI. So I've heard um, like acute urinary retention being described as a urological emergency. So it is important to get an IDC in um, relatively quickly. And then if there is an IDC and you think it's blocked, um, simply flushing it to help dislodge sediments and clots can be done. I, I never really got shown how to do that as a medical student, so I wasn't really confident to do it at the start. But there's lots of nursing staff who are very well versed with this, and they can just show you how to do it. And then once you've seen it a couple of times, then you can do it as well. Um, but, yeah, just get to just flushing and seeing if that helps with draining the IDC. Dehydration, giving them some fluids, so starting with a bolus and some maintenance fluids, and then monitoring the urinary output afterwards to see if it's improving. But also um, realizing that if some of these things aren't working and the patient's really unwell, then the next level may be more like intensive measures such as a vasopressor to help increase the blood pressure to improve renal perfusion. But at that point, that's going to be yet yeah, an ICU referral and discussion with your registrar, et cetera. And just some considerations for low urine apple. We talked about hyperkalemia, which is an important um, issue if they have an AKI. You have the general management approaches such as like, you know, cardiac membrane stabilization with the calcium gluconate, insulin dextrose to get the potassium into the cell and rhizonium to help reduce the long-term kind of absorption. But if they're hyperkalemic, you know, and there's ECG changes, et cetera, just have a chat to your registrar. You, I, I don't think um, that you'd be expected to start this management um, as an intern. And then medication. So important for all these patients to do a medication review if there are any nephrotoxics, withholding them um, until the home team can review and determine whether it's appropriate to start them again. Um, but definitely withholding them in the interim is, is, is an appropriate thing for a ward cover to do. And then, again, your follow-up, so your safety netting. So in general, you want to try and aim to restore the urine output to more than 0.5 um, mils per kilogram per hour. Um, there is such a thing as post-obstructive diuresis where they start to get you know, a fair bit of urine output. And it's just important to ask the nursing staff to monitor the urine output hourly and for, just to, for yourself just to put a note in and recheck that because you want to aim to replace those fluids if they start producing lots of urine. Um, and then in terms of the escalation, again, similar to different um, scenarios, if they're not improving, what you're doing is not working, you're stuck. 
then just escalate into your registrar. Uh, you know, if they're very unwell, calling a met call. And there are obviously scenarios where patients may need dialysis. So if they're very hyperkalemic, they're acidotic, it's severely um, fluid overloaded, then again, registrar met call um, and potentially an ICU referral will be needed. But that's that's low urine output. That's a bit more, I guess, of a tricky one because there's lots of things to think about. Um, but yeah, having that framework, I think, of Oli, Uribus, and your helps kind of show which direction you need to go into. If there's any um, questions about low urine output as the last one? Cool. Well, to end, um, just to just to um, rem uh, remind everyone, that, yeah, there are always people to call for help. Um, yeah, I found it super daunting, um, especially my first few ward cover shifts. You know, I was on gen med and I had so many pages, like 110 or something patients. It's quite stressful, but I had a really good um, registrar and a really good lead med reg. So I'm not sure if there's a clinical lead in every hospital, but definitely at Western Health, there's a clinical lead who's like an AT medical registrar. And they're so helpful um, just to flag and get advice from. And they're really, really, you know, usually quite approachable. So you've always got your, your team registrar out of hours, you get the clinical lead, they can have a chat to you when you're stuck. Other people, I think good just to have um, phone numbers on your mobile, the ICU liaison nurse and the ICU registrar. Again, because if you can't get a hold of your registrars, they're, they're quite experienced and they're, and they're also quite helpful just to get some advice. Um, and then you have the consultant. If you can't get through to you know the registrar, you're really worried about this patient, you know, you can't get through to someone in ICU or something, then speaking to the consultant is definitely appropriate. At the end of the day, it is the the patient is under the consultant's bed card. Um, and they will want to know that if you can't get help, you know, they'll want to know, um, they'll, they'll want to know about the patient before they deteriorate, you know, quite significantly. So Again, you can always call the consultant through switch if, if you've um, tried these other things and it hasn't worked. Um, but yeah, so I guess to summarize, I think using a structured framework, um, that's kind of the general take home message. It just helps as a cognitive aid, helps you tackle any situation and be familiar um, with any situation that you go into using that over the phone um, and instructions, medical record, patient review, differentials, initial management and a follow-up plan. And I found it helpful to just have a pro forma on EMR for, um, for that kind of approach. So when I do my medical record, I can get my pro forma, have a quick read of it, you know, kind of prime my mind into things I need to look at and then go and review the patient. Yeah, and, it's, and it's, it has seemed to help me um, quite significantly. And also having it on your phone as well, just as some little flashcards, just so you can quickly refer to when you're walking around um, on the wards. But yeah, that's the end of the presentation. I hope you've all enjoyed it and got some um, some good points out of it. Thank you for tuning in. Now what's new with ABCs of Anesthesia is that we're forming a whole bunch of very comprehensive courses for every stage of your anesthetic journey from medical student to procedural skills from foundations in anesthesia as well as really important exam lectures and clinical anesthesia courses as well.